just like dirt. Hey, what is up, freaky people? I'm Abby. My artist name is Aropsia. This is the Aropsia podcast. Um, I, I'm not really sure what it's about at this point. Uh, this is the first episode. I am going to show you all of the things that I make. So I've got some paintings to show you. I have some sewing to show you, some knitting, some finished objects, some works in progress. And so I'm just going to talk to you about those things. So yeah, if you are watching this video, that's super cool. I don't know how that happened, but welcome. So I'm in Chicago and it is an overcast, misty kind of morning outside. It's really nice. We had like a super cold beginning of spring, which isn't super strange for the Midwest. It's kind of like, it's normally pretty cold at the beginning of spring here, but just like in this last week, it's warmed up a whole lot. We've had like 70, 80 degree weather. So that's been really nice. The trees have actually budded and there's some like little baby leaves poking out now. There's grass, there's daffodils, lots of flowers everywhere. And it's beautiful. Yeah. What else? Um, not that. So I wanted to film this last week. <laughs> It apparently takes me about a month to edit a video because it's me. I'm gonna have to work on that. I have no excuses other than myself. <laughs> it's always me that gets in the way the most. Three weeks ago, probably now, I think, we, Ian and I, went to YarnCon here. Uh, it's a little yarn convention. I'm pretty sure it's four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, Thursday and Friday they had like classes and talks and things like that. And we didn't go to any of that because it was all while I was working. We went on Saturday and we looked at all the yarn and there was a ton of local like regional Midwest yarns, Midwestern yarns. <laughs> Um, so I found a lot of cool places that I marked on my little map um, so that I can buy yarn from them in the future. I got to touch a lot of yarns that I hadn't touched, so um, that was great. That was like the best part, <laughs> I think. Um, I found out I love alpaca. So I got to feel a bunch of different types of yarn. Um, I purchased some for like little projects. Um, so I got some hand dyed yarns. I got some alpaca. So I'll show you those. Um, I'm not like very, I'm not gonna show you my like acquisitions when I acquire them unless I have casted something on or started a project or something like that. Like I, I don't want to show you that I bought something just to show you that I bought something. I'd rather show you the thing when I am making something with it. And then at that point we can discuss like where I got it and all of that. Um, that being said, I did cast on some things with all three of the yarns that I bought from YarnCon because I was really excited about them. <laughs> um, so they do just have like the tiniest amount. So maybe that's cheating, but we get to cheat. It's our first episode. I think it was April 1st actually, cause we did it for our anniversary. Um, or like we went out to eat afterward for our anniversary. I think that's all I have to tell you before I like just show you what I'm, I'm working on and what I've done. It's not really a good way to show you this. This is camisole number four. I think it's inside out for you. <laughs> God. All right. all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. This thing has just been, I don't know. I like it, but I hate it. I've gotten through the front and back 
triangles and I'm about like an inch and a half into the body. Um, my favorite things knitwear. I'm using Knit Picks Lindy Chain for this, which is a linen cotton blend. I believe it is like 60 or 70% linen and then the rest is cotton. The color is blush. It's a fingering weight yarn. It's a chain construction. Um, I thought I would hate it. I thought I would totally hate this yarn uh, just because like, I don't know, I knew that it wasn't going to be very stretchy, um, which actually I think the chain makes it sort of stretchy in a way. Um, it's not, it's not stretchy. That's not the right word, but it, it like, it has more flexibility because of the chain. I might be lying to myself about that. I don't know, but I do really like it actually. And I love like the texture. I did like a little tiny half gauge swatch just to make sure that I was getting the right amount of stitches to make this. And then I washed it, of course and it did soften up a lot like right now this is like really scratchy and you would think oh i don't want that on my skin <laughs> but as soon as i wash it it's gonna soften up a whole lot and then over time it's linen it's just gonna soften over time um i did i think i did what the pattern called for for my gauge swatch and used size four needles um but then for some reason i used size two <laughs> to make it um because I am a loose knitter and I think maybe what I was thinking at the time was that I was probably like wrenching really hard um, to get gauge with the size four needles. So that's why I used size two so that I could sort of loosen up a little bit. I'm gonna guess that's why I did that. Otherwise, mm, this might not fit for a while. Um, I have made some mistakes. I didn't join in the round correctly because it was confusing to me <laughs> the way that it was written in the pattern. Um, and I put in a lifeline at that point because I was pretty sure I had done it wrong. Um, and then I knit a few rounds and I was like, yep, I did that wrong. Do I want to go back? And at the time I did not have um, thimbles, two thimbles, I only had one thimble. So it was like really starting to hurt my fingers to knit this because these are metal knitting needles. Um, they're pretty pointy and the yarn does not have any flexibility. The needles do not have any flexibility. I like wooden needles because they are like kind of flexible in a way. Um, these are the ones that I have in this gauge. Okay, so I made a mistake. Uh, it was either one row of mistake or two row of mistake. I think it was just one row. It was literally that row where I joined in the round and I didn't do my ribbing correctly because of where the marker was and um, yeah, whatever, I got confused. I didn't want to go back and rip it out to the lifeline because it really hurt my fingers. <sighs> and I don't know, it bothers me a little bit that I didn't do that, but it's like the first garment I've knit. So I really don't care. I just want to finish it <laughs> and I will wear it. And um, no one else is really going to notice that it's a little wonky. Like they might notice it's a little wonky, but they don't care. <laughs> and then I made, I made like a two row mistake um, somewhere else because I just got confused about what row I was on, <laughs> even though I'm using a row counter. It's been difficult. I have been working on it more consistently now that I got two thimbles. So I can do do do. It's also kind of a learning curve to try to knit with two thimbles on your fingers because they're like bulky and so you know the way you grab things is different and I like find myself like holding my fingers up and I need to put them on the needles because there's a lot of strain if you're doing this and like this and like you know that's not good for your hands don't do that <laughs> so I've had to like 
take a lot of breaks and I take a lot of breaks normally anyway because I don't know I get bored <laughs> and I like set things down and then I like pick them right back up so normally I don't really have a huge problem with hand pain but with this project I have for like several different reasons so it's gonna get done when it gets done so that's camisole number four my favorite things knitwear it's beautiful it's gonna be great when it's done hopefully it fits um, I don't know I'm a little concerned about the negative ease I knit the size that they said that I should knit for my bust circumference um, which has I don't know four two inches four inches of negative ease which is not what I want I don't want it to like be touching my body I want it to sort of you know flow away from my body which is how I've seen some people knit it and it looks really great um, it does not look great when it's like skin tight I think though that as like a bra like a bra top bralette whatever it would be a great pattern so if I stopped right now and I put the straps on that would probably be super cute um, I'm not gonna do that I have a ton of this blush left I do want a pink camisole so I will finish it I will finish it I don't know when but I will finish it up next we have a sock my first real sock not a slipper sock not a worsted weight sock but a fingering sock that I should that I should theoretically be able to wear with shoes. <laughs> um, oh, it's okay. All right. So this is the first sock that I've ever knit. So I decided I wanted to try toe up socks and I also wanted to try German short rows for my heel because that's what like commercial socks look like in the heel. Um, they're doing something similar, if not the same thing. I don't know. So this is my sock. This is my first sock ever. I am using the Very Pink Knits. Very Pink Knits pattern for toe up socks with a German short row heel using a magic cast on. I... <laughs> the tutorial that I watched um, to learn how to do the magic cast on was on a magic loop. So I learned how to knit magic loop, I guess. <laughs> so that's cool, I guess. <laughs> uh, I do like it. I knit my first pair of slipper socks with double pointed needles because I wanted to learn on double pointed needles. And my intention was to knit this on double pointed needles. Um, but that's not how I learned to do the cast on. So this is how we're knitting. Um, so I did run into a problem. I got to the length. I don't have the mental energy to try to figure out the German short row heel. I, I think there's a video on YouTube. Um, there's a guy and he's showing you how to do it like in a heel, in an actual heel and not flat or something. Um, so I will watch that and hopefully that'll help me figure it out when I actually have the energy to do it. It's kind of frustrating because I was like super excited to knit this sock. I wanted to knit socks forever. Um, and I got to my foot length and it was really fast. It was like, I don't know, maybe a week to do that. And I thought it was going to take forever because it's such thin yarn, small yarn. It's fingering weight yarn. <laughs> um, I don't think I've knit anything in fingering weight ever until these socks and camisole number four. I think the thinnest gauge that I had used up until now was probably like a DK. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was super excited to get this far and I was like super excited to do the heel. I was like, I'm gonna do this. I'm really confident, I'm gonna figure it out. I did it wrong. I did it wrong like three times and then I was like, fuck. I now have this like awful ridge that's gonna sit right before my heel. 
Uh, so it's probably not gonna be super comfortable, but it doesn't matter. It's the first sock that I ever knit. If I make a mistake on the first sock that I ever knit, then like, I don't care, it's fine. I just need to finish it so that I understand the process and then the next time I'll just be able to do it without making a horrible <laughs> mistake like that. Um, and it might not matter. Maybe it won't bother me. Um, I used to have like a serious sensory issue with socks when I was really little, like six, seven. And that was mostly uh, about the toe seam on commercial socks, like the way that it sat on my foot bothered the hell out of me. So for a period of time, my mom would like cut the toes of my socks off, uh, which apparently was not as irritating right now thinking about it it sounds really irritating and maybe it was and that's why I eventually got over my sensory issue with socks now I love socks I wear socks all the time so it has this ridge it's also slightly longer than I wanted it to be now because I've had to like reorient myself and like fix fix my rows, my stitch numbers, so that I can start the heel from where it's supposed to be started. But I was having a blast knitting this because it's all garter stitch and like if I could just make everything in garter stitch and not have it look like garter stitch, I would do that. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not really that I don't like purling. I don't really mind purling actually. Um, I don't like ribbing when I have to like alternate back and forth between knitting and purling. That's what I really don't like because, again, not actually because I don't like doing the stitches themselves, but it's just the alternating. Like I have to keep track and I lose track and then I have to start counting and like I really don't like counting because <sighs> counting makes me anxious <laughs> because it's like a tool that I use to not feel anxious or that I have used to not feel anxious. Um, yeah, same thing with like breathing exercises. I can't do mindful breathing because it gives me a panic attack. <laughs> so anyway, we're talking about socks and knitting and not about sensory issues and breathing issues and all of that. I'm sorry. It's not gonna be perfect. I just wanna get it done, but I haven't had the, you know, the mind to do it in the last week or so. Um, which sucks because it's supposed to be like my relief project for that camisole because it is so much garter. Um, but I haven't been able to work on it because it's scaring me. <laughs> I will get around to finishing that. I will get around to learning to do a German short row heel because they're supposed to be really easy. I just can't spatially do it. I think I'll be able to figure it out. I just need to like, it's gonna take a few, a few tries. Um, so the yarn that I'm using for those socks is this gorgeous hand-dyed yarn that I got at YarnCon. It's from Passion Yarns. Um, I don't know where Passion Yarns is from. I don't know if it's like a big company. I looked them up, I went to their website um, and they didn't say where they, were, where they were from. So I think they're a bigger company, uh, but either way. This is colorway number 20. It's 80% superwash merino, 10% cashmere, and 10% nylon. 435 yards, 100 grams. And it's like, it's just a rainbow color. It's very primary, secondary color wheel colors. Ian picked this out. Um, I got, I think I got two skeins. I got 200 gram skeins of this, which should make two pairs of socks, I believe. So Dan and I can have matching socks. Um, but if I screw that sock up so bad, um, that I can't wear it, then I'm gonna have to, he's gonna have to get a different pair of socks. It was probably 28, 30 bucks, something like that. I don't remember. That's what it looks like in the ball. And then that's what the fabric looks like. 
It's cute, it's fun, it's very colorful. It's not something that I would have picked, but it is cute, I do like it. It's her socks, so I really don't care. I'll wear just about anything for socks because I just love socks. Now we're gonna talk about the other two yarns that I got at YarnCon. First we have this one, which is by Three Irish Girls Yarn Incorporated. This is Springvale Bulky. It is 100% superwash merino. It's about 98 yards. I think it's 100 grams, probably. I assume so, it's pretty big. Um, and then it's the colorway Yukon. And it has blue and like black and like rusty colors just speckled through out and like an ecru background. And then that's the ball. And this is the teeny tiny little <laughs> inch of a scarf that I started for Ian. Um, and it's just like garter stitch and then it has like some ribbing, an offset ribbing. I'm knitting it on size 10 needles. It's giving like a really nice texture. Um, I used a long tail cast on. It's a little wonky here with like the knit stitches and the ribbing and then the garter. So I don't know. I knit a scarf with superwash merino and it was the first time I'd used superwash and I knew that it grew. Like I had heard that and then this thing grew. <laughs> It got so long, like, I like a long scarf. The scarf was a little crazy. Um, so I think I have three of these because I usually use like three 100 gram skeins for a scarf. I could probably get away with two depending on the person and depending on how wide it is. Um, but this is like a wider scarf. So three skeins, this is for Ian. Um, it's nice. I'm not like a huge fan of merino because it's like, they're like pugs <laughs> as I understand it. Um, they're more likely to get things like fly strike because uh, they were bred to have more folds in their skin so that they could have more wool um, or it could be a different texture or something. I don't know. I'm not like a sheep expert at all, but this is like, uh, <laughs> I was accosted by mulesing. So I was on some hand dyed yarn website and they were like, all of our Merino yarn is mulesing free. And I was like, Oh, what's that? And I just thought it was like, probably a chemical process that, that was used for, for um, making yarn somehow. And like, they're like, oh, we don't have that. And I was like, okay, what is this? And then I read what it was. <laughs> uh, and I was not prepared for that. It's disgusting, I'm sorry. If you go and read about what it is, I'm just gonna tell you it's disgusting. Nobody told me it was disgusting and terrible and sad. So the thing is, you breed this animal, um, so that it's less healthy by design, by the way that you designed this creature, it's less healthy and it's gonna have a less healthy life, either way you slice it. And I understand that other sheep, other animals can get this also, um, but they get it less depending on the breed and depending on where they live. I'm not a huge fan of Merino. I bought it because they had a ton of merino because everybody hand dyes merino because I guess it looks really nice on like a super wash base. I've heard the the dye just catches really well. Um, so I did buy it. I have bought it before. I am trying not to. I don't know a whole lot about anything. I'm not saying that you should do anything. I'm just saying this is what I've read about how this yarn is produced and like I, I just don't want to have anything to do with it. That being said, 
this is Marino. I am not practicing what I preach in this very moment because we don't always, but those are my thoughts. Oh, and three Irish girls I think are from somewhere in Wisconsin. This is my favorite. I'm so excited about this yarn. Ooh, it feels so nice. This is the alpaca. This is my little teeny tiny beginning of a scarf. Um, I'm knitting the best friend scarf. It's a free pattern. You can find it on Ravelry. I found that pattern and I was going to knit it for my friend. I'm still going to knit it for my friend, but like I also needed a scarf. So I was like, oh, why don't I knit us matching scarves in different colors, different yarns? So it'll be like a friendship necklace, but a scarf. Uh, so that's cool. That's fun. This yarn is like so smooth but it's rustic at the same time. And I'm guessing that it's smooth because um, alpaca must be like a, a longer fiber. It's just like a two ply sport weight. It's got a ton of hairs coming off of it. Um, and I love it, I love the color, it's great. Um, they had just natural colors I think is all they had at this booth. And this is from Dietrich's Alpaca Ranch. They are in Illinois. And this is, this yarn is from my buddy and Dakota. They put the names of the alpacas on the yarn. And it is a sport weight. It's 100, or sorry, it's 200 yards. I believe it's 100 grams. It looks like 100 grams. It's $18. And it's gorgeous and I love it. And my hands are getting warm while I'm holding it. So it's a warm yarn. It's gonna be a really warm scarf. I hope it won't be itchy. I don't know. I've never had an actual wool scarf before. So I don't even know if I'll like it, but I really love this yarn. It's so pretty. And it smells so good. Dietrich's Alpaca Ranch. I want more. I only got two skeins because my plan was to make a hat. Um, and then I had the idea to uh, do matching best friend scarves for my best friend. But I think, I think it'll be enough. I think it'll be fine. If not, I'll email them and see if I can get another skein. I don't know if they had like a real online shop. They do have a website, a super cool yarn. Next, these pants. I'm gonna stand up to show you. So these are just a pair of like beachy, loose pants. Uh, they have hip pockets over here. I need to sew down the edge around the pocket so that that sits nice like that on both sides. I have this little waistband in. It's just a drawstring with twill, cotton twill tape that I bought on Amazon. It was super cheap. It's a giant roll. I will never probably need to buy it ever again. Oh, and I need to sew like the top of the pocket to the waistband so that they sit better. That's the back. And then I still need to hem these and they need to be hemmed like quite a bit, like, like inches, <laughs> um, but that's fine. I'd rather them be too long and then have to hem them a lot than have them be too short and I can't fix that. So that's those, the pattern that I used. So I think I used this new look pattern. It's number 6290. 6290, the pants. I somehow lost the uh, back pattern piece for the back of the pants. Um, I don't know where it is. It's probably in this uh, abysmal. 
thing full of patterns. It's probably in the wrong one or otherwise it's in a box in my closet where I have some sewing projects that I have not finished. So I just used the front piece or the back. And I did do a mock-up with muslin and like they fell okay. They didn't like give me a camel toe or anything crazy like that. So I was like, okay, we'll just go with it. It's fine. They're a little tight in the hips, which you don't like. I have massive hips. I can move around in these pants really well. They're really comfortable. They are super thin, so they'll be really nice when it's warm out because the breeze will just go through them, which is like the best. <laughs> these are cotton. Um, I got the fabric from fabric.com before that went away. Amazon sucks. Oh, but I still use it because everybody uses Amazon. It's like the Walmart of the internet. I sewed together those pattern pieces. Um, I basically always do French seams and then I just fell them down to make them flat. Um, I like how it looks. Um, those pants are hand sewn. I didn't use a sewing machine at all for them. Um, I own a sewing machine, but lately I've been hand sewing a lot. Almost done. Very, very nearly done. Two things, gotta do two things and then they're done. And then this is my next work in progress. Let's see. I don't know if you can see that. They're a pair of green linen shorts. I, yes, I, no, oh, about these shorts. Okay, so these were finished already. I made these probably two years ago, maybe a year ago. Um, so I wanted a pair of linen shorts. Already made them. They had a drawstring waistband and um, elastic. And they were too big. Um, they didn't look very good. So I didn't wear them. And I finally ripped out the waistband. So that's why it's all funky looking up there. And I took off probably an inch from each side leg. And I didn't like measure or do anything for that other than the waist. That was about the amount that I wanted taken off the waist. And then it turns out I need to take off more at the leg also. So like I need to do a sort of diagonal here and take all this off because it's like flaring out and I don't like that. <laughs> and they hit just like above the knee, I think. And so I need them to like slim down. That's where I'm at with these. I don't know. I don't know if this is gonna work out today. I'm gonna keep trying. Uh, my camera kept dying because it was overheating. So we're just gonna see. We're gonna see what happens. So I told you that I have to sew down here. Um, and then I'll fell that seam down, fold over the waistband, put in a drawstring, cuff these, and then those shorts will be done. I'll have a nice pair of breezy drawstring linen shorts in green. I don't really like this color. <laughs> I don't think uh, as clothing, I think I'll have less of a problem with it since it'll be on my bottom half and not near my face. But I do like kind of prefer darker greens, more muted greens. This is a little, a little much, but it's what I had. I think that's it for like actual currently working on sewing works in progress. So next I have some finished objects for you. Super excited to show you these. I'm gonna go change. I'll be right back. This is a wrap skirt, just like a circle skirt pattern that I modified and then I added some ties and I didn't join the seams. I just left it flat. 
so that it's adjustable. So if I gain weight or lose weight or whatever, then it'll still fit. And it has great movement. Look at that. It's gorgeous. I love it. It's linen. Don't know what color. It was a linen. It was a light pink. It was from fabric.com. It's like just below the knee. This vest top thing is the same fabric. I used some vintage buttons that I had and the pattern is self-drafted. I did use a tutorial on YouTube. I can't remember the lady's name, but I will find it and I'll link it for you because it was a really great tutorial just to learn how to make a waistcoat. I had made this pattern before, this vest pattern that I drafted in a wool vest, but I lined it and this is unlined. This is just the linen because I wanted everything to be really breezy and nice. But that meant, how do I finish the edges because they're not gonna be like sewed together with a different fabric or anything. So I chose to do a, like a binded edge for it. I wish I had done it here on the button band, but I wasn't really thinking because the button band was extra long so it was able to be like folded over. It looks funny because the binding stops at these points. But I am probably not gonna do anything to fix it because I don't care that much and I think it looks fine. It fits great. Like, it's very comfortable. It's just got like darts in the back. Darts here that don't give me like the pointy uh, rocket boob look, which is great. It's always difficult for me to do boob darts. So yeah, that is my first finished object. And now I have a second one for you. And then here is my second or third finished object. I'm gonna call it third because these are separates. They're just made out of the same fabric, so they do go together as a set. This is a quilted petticoat. And it does hold itself out really well. I can wear the linen skirt over top of it and it like poofs out more like a bell. It's made out of muslin for the front and the back. And then inside it is a 100% cotton batting, quilt batting. It's, I'm calling this a finished object because it's wearable. <laughs> not because it necessarily looks how I would like it to look. It's bound on the edges with this trim. It's not really a binding because it has this, uh, this like crochet cotton edge on it, like in between the two pieces of what we would like think of as binding. I'm not really sure what it's intended for, <laughs> but I bought it for a blazer but I didn't like how it looked, so I didn't use it for that. So yeah, you can kind of see the cotton coming through. I don't know how well this will hold up as an edging, but I tried it. I didn't fully quilt the entire thing. I need to. I need to quilt more of it so that when I wash it, it doesn't like get all icky and scrunched up. It is warm. It is not seasonally appropriate anymore. I'm gonna make another one, a like full length one, I think. This is me attempting to do some embroidery. I don't have the patience for embroidery right now. So I got part of a flower done, not even a whole flower, but I do like it. It's super cute. If I ever feel like doing embroidery, I can do that. It's good shape, hides my uh, hips pretty darn well. And it hides, maybe accentuates because it makes it look bigger. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but it looks good. I think it's a flattering shape for me. So that's that. Those are my crafts, my sewing, my knitting. So now I'm gonna talk to you about these guys over here, paintings. I'm gonna do this left to right, I guess. This painting is gesso, watercolor, and pastel on canvas. I think there's some ink, actually, also. Yeah, there's there's 
gold ink and white ink, I believe, like an iridescent white. And the gesso creates like a raised, bumpy kind of texture, and that lets the paint kind of dry and like pool in some nice ways. And then it lets the pastels catch on the ridges. As far as brushes go, I do you. <laughs> I don't use brushes really anymore very much. I mostly just kind of like pour water and like guide it and like use the brush to uh, add pigment to the water while it's on the canvas. I tend to use like really big brushes, like house painting brushes, not like actual painting paint brushes that you find at like an art supply store. I do have those. Most of them are just really cheap. Yeah, whatever, doesn't matter. Okay, so this first painting. So this painting is a work in progress. It's the ground for a portrait. I have a picture of one of my friends. I'm gonna paint her. I think it'll look great. <laughs> it's helping me learn how I make portraits. Oh, I think it's a really nice ground. The colors are really gentle and subtle and soft, and that's what I like. Uh, and then we're gonna go over here to the top right. This is a portrait of Ian. It has a whole lot of metallics in it now that I'm like looking at his face. His face is very metallic, which is super cool. I like it. This is also a work in progress. It's really close to being done. I just have to fix his hair because right now his, his head is like melting into the background, which is what I do want but I, he looks bald. I want him to look like he has hair. So I have to figure something out there. And then I think I have to do something to fix his eyes so that they're a little more punchy, so they feel a little bit more concrete in focus. Yeah, like all of my markers are dry right now, so it's really hard to finish the painting when you don't have your finishing tool. And that's usually how I finish my paintings is with like a micron pen or marker or like a sharpie I guess. I don't really like sharpies. I really prefer the microns. They have a better line quality. I think his hands are fine. I think maybe I'll fix up the cigarette area a little bit more. Carve out some areas. He has multiple hands or his hands are in multiple different positions. Maybe I'll like add a hand somewhere or something for that like motion, that sense of like push and pull. I'm pretty happy with it. It's the first portrait that I've painted in a really long time. And since I started painting in watercolors, I was like, okay, well, I really like this style. I like what I'm doing here. So it's just sort of in the exploratory process. I like that I did not do a whole lot of drawing of this figure or anything. It just sort of emerged. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. I just you know I spill I spill the colors on and then they do what they do. I did do some masking for this, just to like hold down where the uh, jacket was and like where the hand was and like different some different things like like big things and that like creates a sort of a line like a design element and then you can use that. It's very textured. I did the ground. And then I gessoed over the ground where the body was gonna be. And I think I did that when the paint was still a little bit wet underneath, but it turned out really well. It like smeared in a nice way. And then I also have like this chunky texture on the arm from salt. He's rubbing alcohol and bubbles to do the ground on this one. And it's really nice because right to the right of his head is like this bubble. Yeah, I never thought, oh, I'd get to paint by blowing bubbles, but now I do. Next, we have this tree on the bottom left. It is currently just watercolor. There's gonna be like a family tree sort of genogram probably use like different symbols than the standard symbols just to like obscure the meaning so that I'm not just like airing my dirty laundry <laughs> in my art which is not really what I want to do it's it looks better than I thought it would I guess I don't know 
I'm not crazy about it yet. It's not finished yet. It needs more work. Fourth and final painting. Bottom right. This one is the first one that I did the, uh, the gesso with. It's also watercolor and chalk pastel. And I did use the chalk pastels when everything was still like a little wet. So some of, some things like moved and smeared in some really nice ways that they didn't really do in the other picture because I think I waited until that was dry, but then like because the texture wasn't right, didn't really work out. Yeah, anyway, but I think I'm just gonna leave it as is. It's not gonna have like a portrait or anything on it. It's just gonna be what it is. And it has like really beautiful, vibrant colors. That's all I have to say about this one. It's just pretty. It's just a pretty thing. Sometimes it's nice to just have pretty things. It was fun to make. So now I'm gonna tell you what I think about my paintings or something. I'm gonna show you all of my pictures currently. So that's all the pictures together. The lamp on the left, the painting of the lamp, not the lamp that the painting is of. So that's the finished painting that I have for this series, for this body of work. I love the palette. I like the idea of trying to contain this like moving, liquid, uncontainable substance that water is. And I like having artifacts of the materials that I used to try to contain the water. So on the lamp, I did the ground and then I uh, gessoed over certain areas so that I could then paint more. So I used like wide masking tape to create the lampshade shape. And when I took the tape off, it like left a texture, a shape, an outline of itself. By removing part of the paint, whatever happened, happened. Um, but yeah, there was like an outline of the tape. So I really liked that. And I used like a marker, a micron pen to like outline certain parts of that to bring them out, to make them more obvious. And that's in different spots. It's at like the bottom too, on the base of that pedestal. And I also use the, uh, the markers to like outline other artifacts from like maybe the alcohol that I used. It created like a pattern. And so like I kind of outlined that or salt, you know, whatever effect. Like I'm, I'm sort of outlining certain areas to bring attention to them with like a really thin black line. I want them to look like they just sort of appeared. They just sort of flowed out of, out of the water. I don't want things to be like concrete and crisp and clean and in sharp focus. I have like basically no interest in sharp focus. I've never had much of an interest in sharp focus. So I really like like immersive installation pieces. And I think that these are probably a part of that. There will probably be like some sort of textiles included in this, but I don't know what that looks like yet. I wanna do weaving and spinning, obviously. So that's gonna be part of this, I think. So that I can create like a whole atmosphere. So you walk in and it's just this like soothing, soft, cloudy, pastel space just want it to be happy and unrestrained and just chill. <laughs> I'm interested in, I don't know, I hate saying exploring when I'm talking about art. I feel like I'm not exploring anything. It's art. I'm not, there is no truth in art. Philosophy is concerned with truth. Art is concerned with expression. I guess 
I, that's a better word, I'm expressing. <laughs> I'm expressing these ideas with, with my paintings, with my art. And so those ideas are things like, um, like a Wu Wei sort of idea, path of least resistance, acceptance. I'm interested in expressing possibility. All things are happening simultaneously and we are constantly branch lining into different worlds, different realities based on it. Like, you know, every motion that we take, every action that we take, every word that we say creates a new line and how those are all existing simultaneously. And like, oh, what if you could actually see these things overlaid on top of each other? And like, what a what a wonderful mosaic would that be? Just copies of copies of copies. So yeah, I'm just sort of interested in how everything is connected and yet nothing ever touches. There's always a gap. There's always a space between things. There's always a gap between our understanding of the world and ourselves and others. That's what I've been thinking about while making this body of work. I've been really influenced by Ian and his philosophical ideas, which branch line from David Lewis's philosophical ideas from like the 80s. Hugh Everett the third. Yeah, so he proposed the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, which is the idea that we branch line into different dimensions depending on our actions, um, depending on observations. I don't know that you can prove it because of the nature of two different worlds. You can't be in two worlds at once. There can be another version of you that is basically you. Yeah, I'm not gonna be <laughs> the best at describing this. Hugh Everett and Ian both believe that we are all immortal. If I haven't lost you yet, I'm gonna lose you now. So good, good first episode. So they believe that we are all immortal because, so if we're constantly branch lining, then there will always uh, theoretically be a branch line where you exist. Ian's, Ian's difference is that he doesn't think that we're immortal like in this world. He just thinks that we have like trans world immortality. So, you know, when you die here, you're going to like branch line into some other world. He, <laughs> he has a lot of math to back this up. I'm not even going to try to explain it. There's no God in this theory. It's just that you, that you have to continue in some form. And he ever believed that he was immortal, but I think he believed that he would be immortal in this world the entire time and that just doesn't make sense for this world maybe he's right maybe like we all just live long enough to become robots <laughs> in in some worlds and that's how we like continue on um i don't know so this is my expression of these ideas and so yeah i'm just like trying to create this malleable beautiful mishmash of possibility. Man, that juice is sweet. All right, so that's it. Thanks for watching me ramble about arts and crafts. Appreciate you hanging out. <laughs> yeah, let me know what you think. <laughs> if you, a human, a robot, anybody who's watching this video and wants to, uh, is there anything else? I don't think there's anything else. I think that's it. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. See you later.